Hello everyone and welcome to this, the final session of our conference for an alternative United Ireland. My name's Conor Eddy uh, and I'll be chairing the discussion uh, today, rounding off what I think uh, has been, uh, and I hope you think too, a lively uh, day of debate and, uh, and discussion. I guess uh, when we first planned this conference, we'd hoped to uh, open up a space uh, to address the question of Irish unity uh, in a very distinct way, beyond uh, the orange-green boundary, uh, past talk of flags, and of course the high politics of kind of constitutional change. So I think we all in this room, uh, and it's been reflected in the discussion throughout the day, believe that real change comes from below, from people fighting on the ground to shape and change the world around us in a progressive direction. So today we've heard from activists all across the island and some from across the world too, representing movements and causes that present a very different future indeed, far more than the simple stitching together of the two existing states on the island. So from talk of climate justice and the just transition to women's liberation, the radical Protestant tradition, the fight against racism, I think we caught a glimpse of the forces that we believe should and can shape the discussion around a new and united Ireland and how it can be realised. So I guess our objective with this conference was to showcase what uh, the great Derry socialist referred to, Eamon McCann, as uh, an emerging movement of a united Ireland rather than for a united Ireland. So I guess we want this conference uh, to be a first step uh, towards building a radical pole uh, in the debate around Irish unity to make our mark uh, on the question and seize what I think is really a transformative potential offered up by the ending of the two conservative states on this island. So we hope that um, to follow up on this conference with a series of other meetings. Um, so this will hopefully be the first step and possibly uh, we'll see real world initiatives come off the back of it too, to unite, I guess, a broad left around a common vision of what a united Ireland could look like. Um, so in that kind of sense, uh, I'd encourage people, you've probably all seen it at this stage, uh, we have a special statement uh, that gathers contact details of participants. We want to kind of use this to follow up uh, after the conference. So I'd encourage you all to sign that now if you haven't already and to share it with anyone that you think might be interested uh, in participating as we move forward past the conference. So just before I bring in uh, our excellent speakers for this uh, final panel, I want to make a few more announcements. So first of all, uh, you probably heard in the other sessions, all of our sessions are recorded. We're going to be posting them online afterwards. So if you've missed any discussions today, and I know there have been a few, some tough choices between different panels uh, and that kind of thing, you will be able to hopefully uh, watch them back after the fact, uh, which is great. Uh, we have for this final session invited members of the press along so just uh, if people are making comments bear that in mind uh, and then I guess the, the final thing to say before I introduce the speakers is that we have a hashtag uh, which has actually been trending throughout Ireland all day uh, re re really really good on that front and it's the alt united Ireland so really uh, I'd like to encourage people to uh, go hell for leather now and let's push it as high as we can to get our highlight to get highlights from the conference out and uh, our message uh, disseminated I think far and wide. So I guess without uh, further ado, I'll introduce uh, our panel in the order that they'll speak. So first up, uh, we're going to hear from Thomas Pringle. Thomas Pringle's uh, a TD for Donegal. He's been a TD since uh, 2011. And over his lifetime, I guess Tommy's been a, a, a left Republican, championing a variety of causes from uh, reform of the common agricultural policy and fisheries uh, policy in Europe, to uh, more recently campaigning for a referendum to enshrine social and cultural rights in the constitution. So that's something that's very relevant, I think, uh, to any question of uh, a new uh, state on this island, the question of social and cultural rights. We might hear a bit about that from Tommy. After that, we're going to hear from Goretti Horgan, uh, who I think probably needs no introduction, but I'll give her one anyway. Uh, Goretti's been a force in the Irish left now for uh, decades. Um, she was part of the leadership of the original campaign to um, uh, against the Eighth Amendment. Uh, she's fought throughout her lifetime for workers, for communities and uh, the environment. And more recently, she's been an activist with Derry uh, Alliance for Choice and a co-founder of the campaign for an all Ireland national health service and I think Gretti will tell us a little bit about that really important campaign uh, when she makes her contribution and then to close us off we'll hear from Jerry Carroll our P people before profit M MLA for West Belfast and one of the organizers of this conference so Jerry will bring the conference to a close and hopefully give us a bit of a message and we might have a surprise uh, lined up for for you all before he does that so I guess without further ado uh, I'll hand you over to Thomas Pringle You'll start us off. Um, thanks, thanks very much, Connor, and um, 
Um, thanks for thanks for the introduction there, and um, uh, thank, thanks for the invite to address the meeting today. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend any of the other sessions. There's a, a few other things on today, um, so I'm just coming in for the session now. It sounds like it was a, a very good day and very very worthwhile uh, conference, and that, that's fair play to you all. And congratulations for um, for for achieving that. Um, and I think it's a, a discussion that needs to continue on as well, as you said. And I'm glad to see that that, that will happen because. Um, I think there is a lot of work to be done in terms of delivering a United Ireland, and especially in terms of delivering the United Ireland that we want. Um, it's probably relatively easy to deliver a United Ireland based on the mirror image of Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, and the DUP. Um, and, but and you know, and that's probably what we'll what we'll achieve, what we'll get. But um, we'll, the work work will continue then to make to shape that into uh, an Ireland that we can all um, be proud of, I suppose, and an Ireland that recognizes that that um, all citizens have it on the mirror image. Um, you know, I suppose I I was think, thinking about about it and just thinking about what what the discussion was going to be about. Probably maybe I've missed the point a wee bit of that we'll see you later on when we get through it anyway. But you know, I mean it is it's timely now we're at the hundredth anniversary of the partition of the partition of Ireland and uh, it's timely that we should be discussing what uh, a United Ireland uh, will be and whether a United Ireland actually can come about as well, which I, I do think is more than achievable. And I think it probably in the next couple of years is going to be um, achieved and uh, it's going to be, become uh, uh, a reality. And what we'll have to do then is to shape that into a United Ireland that um, we can all participate in and that recognises everybody's um, rights and needs as well. Um, because, you know, I mean, I think even in, in 1916, James Connolly recognised that England was a problem, and England was a problem for Ireland, and that the only way that um, we can uh, achieve the mass of the nation or what the nation want, needs and Needs and wants today, having the last year or so, um, probably what is shown should should have shown to a lot of uh, most people is that um, as far as parties, we're all parties anyway. And um, that's the reality. Of it. Um, come together and work together to make. Now, in reality, what's going to happen? First of all, probably a united. Uh, United, whatever we have at the moment, current state, but I mean, basically, what we realistically, what we'll have to look forward to is um, a United Ireland, which is going to be governed and run probably by Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, and the DUP, or a combination of unionism. Um, because in reality, that's under the electoral system that we have and under the system that we have here in the state, which will, will be a system in the United Ireland. Um, that's, that's the configuration that will um, probably take power and probably be in power, and um, you know, and I think probably un unionism will come around to to seeing that over the next um, while as well, and see that they have more to gain um, from being in the United Ireland than having been in uh, in. Uh, or whatever there and said you know they said to him that if you want to have an influence on what happens in, in Ireland that's what you have to do or what happens in Belfast is you have to go back and get the storm and up and running and then you can have a direct influence and you can prevent um <laughs> uh, abortion rights and you can prevent the, the stuff happening and, and realistically that
Thomas, I might just interrupt you there for a second. If you could turn off your video, yeah, maybe, I think we're having yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's a, yeah, the broadband would be the best up here in the Donegal, so we'll, <laughs> we'll have to unite Donegal the rest of Ireland as well, too, probably, <laughs> after this, but, um, yeah, so maybe, maybe that's better now, sorry, sorry about that, but, you know, so, so what, what, I, what I think, we're, what we're going to see and what we're going to see happening is that uh, the, we, we'll have, a, a, an initially have a United Ireland that will be run by Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and, the, and various form, form, formation of unionism, and, um, and unfortunately, that's, like obviously we try and create something that would be um uh different than that and they, and then south we will we'll continue to try and create a proper state that that actually recognizes and works on behalf of all citizens um you know but that may not be achievable in the same time frame but um so and we may we may achieve that in the south and then have to redo it again on a united island basis but i mean i think that's a, a task well worth doing and, and well worth um uh, achieving and if it comes to pass i would be more than happy with that as well um as, as things stand I'll, I'll take a united Ireland with the dup in power <laughs> and uh, whereas at least then we can we can work to to getting rid of them on an all on an all, all island island basis, but you know, so I think I think those are the things that, that are going to happen. And, and like you said, we do have a need. We have to address in the south stuff like economic, social, and cultural rights and things like that for our own citizens in the south and for our citizens of the of the and the whole island. And you know, and if we can get some of that work done in the south, maybe that'll go some way to shaping what the United Ireland will look like and what we can achieve at the early stages of United Ireland. Um, but uh, you know. And you know, and I say, you know, so that's that's what's going to happen. And like whether we we whether we decide that we have to make it make it happen, the reality is that we have to unite the country as well. And um, I think we should we can achieve both. And I think we can be working on that. But I think if we achieve in the south, if we achieve uh, equality and stuff like that, it will be undermined by United Ireland. Um, I, initially, I think so because um, the establishment unions and stuff like that there won't want to uh, have they they're going to be like Finn Gale and Fianna Fáil. they're going to oppose any progressive move that we make in, in the south and um, and I think that ultimately what we need to do is to have working class Protestants and and ordinary ordinary Protestant people um, buy into that as well we need unionism to um, break down a bit in, in relation to that too and I think that will happen through United Ireland um, and I think it'll happen sooner rather than later as well. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Tommy. I think uh, I've seen a couple of people say it in the chat, but definitely uh, free and uh, reliable broadband has to be one of those social and cultural rights that uh, everybody is given access to in uh, any alternative uh, United Ireland. That's for absolute certain. Um, so I, I think we'll move on now to hear a little bit from uh, Greddy Horgan and I guess Greddy someone like I said earlier on who's been involved in basically every movement that has been in the island for the last uh, last number of decades and I think really that that, that that approach to the question of United Ireland to see the, the move towards unity as being kind of a movement of movements is a really powerful way of framing the question um, like I said earlier on that quote uh, a movement of United Ireland rather than for United Ireland is a really powerful one and regardless of background uh, we've seen uh, in the, the women's movement in particular, people uniting across the sectarian divide and across the island uh, in all cities and towns um, to, 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 to call for change, whether that be uh, justice for the survivors of sexual violence or for reproductive rights. So maybe on that note, uh, I'll hand over to, uh, to, to Gretti and she can uh, fill us in a little bit more. Yeah, thanks, Connor. Um, so I guess I, um, I was um, brought up um, in, I was born and brought up in Cork come from the Republic, spent, uh, moved north when I was 30. I've now spent more than half my life in the north, so I'm kind of like a, 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 an All-Ireland uh, in myself. Um, and I'm speaking from the border, of course, so if I used to leave my house now, I could walk to the border in 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, so, and it's also the place, as uh, Thomas's, the place where COVID numbers are three times higher than any other part 
of um, the North. And I think like the highest in Europe or something at the minute, you know, per head of uh, population. And of course, there's a reason for that because thousands of people cross the border for work every day and not just for work, but like if you want to post, if I want to post a letter to one of my nieces or something, I'll go across the border to post it. It makes more sense. Um, and so we know that the border counties have been like the worst affected by COVID and COVID, it seems to me, has really um, exposed the ridiculousness of the border um, on this little island. Um, I, I mean, and the fact that we haven't pooled our resources and established, you know, less streamlined one test and trace and tracking system across the whole island, for example. You know, like the, the COVID-19 really, I mean, um, I've been asked to say a wee bit about the campaign for an All-Ireland um, NHS. And really it became a necessity once the pandemic hit. Because once the pandemic hit, we suddenly could see sh very sharply how poor our health services on both sides of the border are. I mean, they're better here in the north because they're free at the point of use. Um, but actually, the waiting lists on both sides of the border are, you know, very similarly far too long. And now, after COVID, are going to be. I mean, they reckon up here that it could take about five years for the waiting lists to recover. Um, from and so that means a lot of people dying of cancer or dying of other uh, treatable illnesses. When you look at things like um, the number of ICU beds that we have per hundred thousand of population, very similar north and south. It's like five point two on one side of the border and five point three on the other side of the border. No difference. Um, we have that means that we have like some of the worst. Um, we're, we're among the worst of all of the OECD countries. Um, when it comes to the number of ICU beds. And that's not relevant just for COVID. That's relevant if you need an operation for anything. That's, you know, uh, the, the fact the, the lack of the ICU beds is what stops people getting their hip replacements, it's what stops people getting their heart bypasses, um, etc. Um, so the pandemic really has brought in uh, to um, uh, it, very sharply into, into focus the need for radical change. Um, it's also really shown how it's possible to change things very quickly when it's necessary. I mean, we were kept on being told there was no money tree, no magic money tree. The next thing the pandemic hits and they can find billions of, of pounds, you know, down the back of the sofa. So if that's the case, you know, it really shows like only about um, 10 years ago, um, we, we saw an estimate that $87 billion could actually really solve the climate emergency. Um, and $87 billion was seen as such an amount of money that we couldn't possibly consider um, spending that money to save the planet that we live on. Now $87 billion is kind of like small change. It's the kind of thing you give Boris Johnson would give his mates, you know, um, as, uh, as they pass by him. So, um, so the, the, you know, we've really, the pandemic has really shown um, the extent to which um, the money is there for the kind of decent health service that we need on both sides of the border. But actually also on both sides of the border, um, the, an awful lot of our hospitals and our care homes um, have religious orders running them um, and actually have religious control. And that's the case in the North as well. So, I mean, you see Jerry looking a bit quizzical there. The Mater Hospital in Belfast, you can't get contraception in the Mater Hospital. You don't want to be having, you know, you don't want to be sent to the maternity wing, basically in the matter, frankly, because you know it is ma matter misericordia like hospital, and um, so you know it's very much run on, um, uh, you know, ca uh, Catholic principles. And north and south, we need to make sure, and it's one of the kind, you know, when we're looking at uh, the kind of uh, grassroots campaigns that can actually be, you know, the campaigns of a united Ireland, then one of them is getting the church out of all of our, um, our, our education system, our healthcare system, and um, the whole lot. And actually Siobhan Kilroy um, this morning, um, speaking as a survivor of a mother and baby home, made a really good point. And I advocate, I'll be advocating for this as one of our campaigns that we'll be having to have. And that's that she says that she will know that she's in a decent United Ireland when the state has expropriated the um, buildings and the lands that the church owns has taken Besbra in particular and turned Besbra home to where, remember, there was a 71% infant mortality rate during the 1940s, uh, taken Besbra home and turned it, um, uh, memorialized it, like Auschwitz is memorialized for, uh, to remember the, uh, the Holocaust. 
um, and where the rest of those um, lands and buildings are sold off to pay for compensation for survivors, not just of the mother and baby homes, but of clerical abuse scandals, of the industrial uh, schools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I mean, I think that that kind of a campaign is exactly the kind of thing um, that we should be, it'll be very, very controversial, but it'll certainly um, sort the, uh, whatever it is, the goats from the sheep or whatever the expression is, um, in terms of sorting people out. And I think that, uh, you know, people on both sides of the border um, would actually see that um, as making a lot of sense. No, it is already, this is not, the Campaign for an All-Ireland NHS has already got huge levels of support. And um, we've got the support of, I don't know about, um, I think Connor can um, uh, give me the exact figures, but I think we've got the support of three or four councils on this side of the border and a similar number on the other side. Um, and I actually did the presentation to the Fermanagh, um, uh, Oma and Fermanagh Council, and I was really surprised by um, how even the DUP were willing to engage um, on the idea of an All-Ireland NHS, as long as it was an NHS, as long as it was free at the point of, um, of use, they could actually see that it made sense on an island as small as we are. Um, and in particular, because it's so difficult in Fermanagh for them to get doctors, they could see that it would make sense that they'd use Sligo and Sligo, or, or, or they'd use uh, Monaghan and Cavan, and that uh, similarly, you know, we'd um, uh, uh, people from those uh, uh, counties um, would uh, would come north. So the whole idea of um, you know an, an all island NHS um, is certainly one I think whose uh, whose time has come, and the campaign is lobbying to basically to kind of extend the NHS principle. Uh, principles to the south and also and very important uh, so first of all there's kind of two things there's uh, as a first step for the south to take private hospitals well actually for both sides of the border to take private hospitals into public control but also to establish north and south um, a free at the point of use national care system because social care has been completely ignored um, a, well, actually across these islands, um, mainly because of misogyny. Uh, Beveridge, who, who set up um, the National Health Service and set up the welfare state um, in Britain, and which, which obviously operates in the, the North as well, um, Beveridge saw women's place as being in the home. He was very, very clear about that. And he said that women will be in the home and they will do the caring. They look after the children, they look after the elderly, they look after disabled people. So therefore we don't need a social care system, which is why there's no social care system attached to the NHS. And of course that chimed perfectly with the church's view in the south of Ireland um, of you know what who should be looking after the whole idea of subsidiarity that the family must look after those who are um, uh, disabled or older and of course children also and actually today's announcement uh, from the citizens assembly on uh, gender um, is actually really really interesting and it shows how much um, our arguments for the need for a national um, health, uh, national social care system, uh, north and south, uh, really chimes with uh, what the majority of people want, because the um, the while while a lot of the talk is about you know removing the article that says women's places in the home from the constitution, the rest of the stuff that the citizens assembly came up with is absolutely amazing. They've they overwhelmingly so all of these votes were more than ninety five percent of the citizens assembly voting for this. They voted to improve the terms and conditions for those in paid employment as carers, whether that's uh, ch in child care or whether it's for care of, of adults, that they should have a pay structure and benefits, including sick pay and pensions, that reward their level of skill and training, similar to those of teachers and nurses. Absolutely, that is absolutely what we would want as a minimum um, in, uh, uh, in any kind of national care system. They also said that uh, carers should have a career structure, including access to training and professional registration, uh, which enables them to progress in their chosen area. They want the Citizens Assembly wants to see a reform of carers allowance, increasing the level of income uh, disregard, reimbursing the costs associated with uh, caring, increasing the ceiling on the number of hours in paid work outside the home and providing access to state employment and training programs for unpaid carers um, in, uh, in, in the home. Crucially, over the next decade, it says, that um, Ireland needs to move, and I would love this to be in the north as well as the south, because we have no childcare system, no publicly childcare system in the north, the same as in 
um, as in the South. And they've uh, argued that over the next decade, we need to move to a publicly funded, accessible and regulated model of quality, affordable, early years and out of hours childcare. Out of hours childcare, imagine that like, I mean, women have been calling for that uh, for years and people look at us like we've got three heads at the idea of saying that you'd have out of hours um, childcare. And um, the, uh, the Citizens Assembly called to increase the state share of GDP spent on childcare by the current from the current 0.37% to at least 1% by no later than 2030, which is actually the UNICEF target. Now, like that's absolutely brilliant. And you see, when I mean people before profit does have a very similar kind of an, uh, a, a, a child care policy to that, I know, and a lot of the left parties do. But you know, when you when you produce it, people tell you that you're mad, like. How could you have that childcare that's publicly funded and accessible and, um, you know, uh, with the with the people with the people who are working there and um, paid properly and all that? So I know I've been going on a bit long. Now. I, I I think I probably need to draw my no, am I okay for another two minutes? Yeah, okay. And um, so, uh, yes. Um, so the 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 question of social care really has to be at the heart um, of um, any um, new NHS, but also it has to be. Uh, the whole idea of gender and care issues generally um, have to be at the care of any project uh, for United Ireland. We've seen both in the, the uh, during this conference, um, but also frankly on the streets, that um, the women and especially younger women um, are among the most radical um, of the, uh, the people who are fighting uh, for a different kind of Ireland. De Valera himself said that women were at once the most radical, but the most un, unmanageable of revolutionaries. Um, and I think that's clearly the case still today um, on, across, across the island of Ireland. So, uh, you know, uh, as I argued in, in the earlier, um, in an earlier session, and um, you know, what we need uh, to, what we really should be aiming for, what we should be aiming for is the sit kind of situation that you had with the Berlin Wall, that the people of Ireland themselves tear down the border metaphorically because it's not really there in the way the Berlin Wall was but the but that the actual people through you know bottom-up campaigning grassroots campaigning actually bring about the United Ireland that we're talking about and the border poll will then only need to be a kind of a, a, a formality and um, that uh, that needs to be got over to satisfy the kind of more timid timid elements but that that is really what we need to see and that would also mean that the binaries that people have been talking about between protestant working class people here in the north and um and 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 and, and people of catholic religion or no religion at all that those kind of binaries will be gone because we will all be people who are fighting for a decent kind of ireland a socialist ireland and an ireland where um, things like gender issues and care issues are at the heart of the project that we're building so that you know when you think back to the proclamation uh, the 1916 proclamation and the kind of um like uh, different ireland that was talked about particularly from the uh, the first all and um, that you know that we can really be looking for the kind of Ireland where all of us can, where there be no inequality, uh, and where um, you know um, women, men, Catholic, Protestant, gay, straight, black, white, you name it, that um, we are all uh, and people of all genders and all religions and all um, uh, races um, can actually and all ethnicities um, can actually live in. Uh, you know the kind of the kind of society that that we all want to see. So I'll shut up there because I can see that I'm kind of going to get myself in trouble by not mentioning somebody who we want to see included um, in our uh, in our new Ireland. Thanks very much, Greddy. That was uh, that was excellent, and I think you spoke really powerfully about the, the centrality of that question of uh, I guess care and like. It, against the backdrop of uh, climate breakdown, a lot of people talk about the need for a very Different type of society, a care a society grounded in the values of care and repair, as opposed to kind of endless growth. So I guess that's a whole other aspect here, and like these these things do open up uh, uh, the possibilities of I guess undercutting uh, the appeal of sort of reactionary unionism and I guess flag wave and nationalism, and the possibility of something very different uh, indeed. 
Um, just before I hand over to Jerry Carroll, who's going to round off our conference, I'd like to introduce two very uh, special women indeed, two women that have led a really, uh, a really inspirational fight for the last 380 odd days, uh, a fight that uh, has had uh, an All-Ireland uh, dimension. They, uh, of course, travelled uh, up to the north to uh, other stores uh, uh, in the middle of their strike uh, in the summer last year. Uh, they engage in acts of solidarity mm -hmm. With workers from Harland and Wolf and in other places too. And those people are Jane Crumb, Debenhams, and uh, Carmel Redmond, also Debenhams. So we might all uh, join, I guess, in a virtual round of applause for Jane and Carmel, and then we'll hear from them. We sign autographs tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you hear us? We can, yeah, we can. All right, right. Sorry, I, I can't get onto my uh, laptop there. The, the, so we're on my phone. So that's why we can't see anybody else uh, other than us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I, was down there, I was down earlier on talking about um, our, our journey for the last year. Um, I forgot to mention the occupations as well that um, uh, happened throughout the, the country as well and in Patrick Street and... Uh, Henry Street and, and Waterford, which uh, was amazing as well. Uh, Carmel was their uh, little cheerleader down in um, Henry Street while we were up on the balcony shouting down. And Connor. Oh, I, well, and I know Connor is Jerry. Was yeah. yeah, and Jerry, or not Jerry, uh, Eddie. Eddie tried to figure out his phone. Um, <laughs> hi, hi, Eddie, I know you're there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we've, we've just done... So much um, so in the much. last year. Yeah. Uh, people for profit have been amazing. Uh, every other supporter from any other group that was there um, were absolutely fantastic. Um, we've just we've learned so much. Yeah. Yeah. We've 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 grown in ourselves. Mm -hmm. All of us have grown in ourselves. All the picketers around the country. Uh, we, as we always say, where we were just mammies and and, and grandmothers. Working away, uh, earning our living, no pay our mortgage. No yeah. Lives. yeah, never spoke out in public. No, we never did. Um, and then to to go to occupy a building, and I remember it was actually Sive, the the, the lovely love Sive. We both love Sive. Mm -hmm. uh, dragging me in through the window that we fell into, um, and then uh, she was sitting right beside me up in Blanchardstown when we were lifted off the road there by the guards and for some reason we ended up sitting beside each other in the Loden Bay and Henry Street as well uh with a little partner in crime but uh yeah terrible <laughs> yeah um I think this I'm not just saying this because of this but I think when we when we started our picket first we really were lost mm. all we had was the knowledge that this is wrong and people have to know and where do we go from here? So we started like the first day of picket and it was before a ballot was even taken. We got together and we hit the streets and it was COVID and everything else. And we were nearly thrown off uh, Henry Street because of the guards. And I think just shortly after that, people before profit were, were with us, with us all and I remember after a few weeks, a few months, saying to Jane, "No, these people are so good." Now, I'm not. This is not about praising you, but I have to say it anyway. That um, I said to Jane one day, "If these are serious, we're, you know, to 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 have this party together, people before profit." I said, "I'd never have to worry about my my kids or anything going on because the charities were so passionate and." Um, since then, J Jane and I signed up with John Whipple and filled in the forms. But getting back to, to the picket, we've grown so much. You don't think in your adult life you could grow anymore, but you learn so more. And you, you realise, even the where we did our picket uh, panels in Parnell Street there, at the back of um, the Debenhams on the Loden Bay, the people. It was all about the people for us, wasn't it, Jane? Yeah, definitely. They were just brilliant just coming along and helping us and caring for us. And then you end up caring about them. And even now, Thursday night going into Friday, 
the people out from got out of their their beds and came down in their PJs to to support us. And um, it's it's very humbling too. It's 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 isn't it, Jane? It's it's, it it's very moving and yeah. yeah. I've yeah, no I more to say. I think I'll probably speak for everybody in the room with us here today that we're all standing with you, whether we're on the picket with you the other night or watching from a distance, we all stand with you uh, in, in what you were put through by the, the Gardaí, uh, by KPMG and everybody else. We're all right behind you. And I think over the course of the last year, you've really shown how ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And the types of transformation that we've talked about here, the possibility of an alternative United Ireland to be driven by people like yourselves uh, from the Low, uh, really, really pushing for a different type of society. So you've done yourselves proud. You've done, I think, workers all over Ireland proud, and you've set an example for people uh, to follow uh, in fights ahead. So I think again, just everybody uh, from the conference, I I'd extend on their behalf a, a thank you for everything that you have done uh, and will continue to do. So is there anything more that you think um, people could do to, to show their support and solidarity with yourselves? I think. I don't know where we are with our picket now, but I think solidarity, that word for me now is to go and stand beside somebody else now. Like if it's, you know, the SB workers, um, what's happening, what's going to come down the line that, that we're all equal in all of this, whether it's, it's not me today, but somebody else tomorrow. And um, I think it's all about, it's all about, it is solidarity, it isn't is, it? It yeah, is, yeah, People definitely. We're at a stage now, especially with the pandemic and now people have to, to come back together and realise that it's, it's, it's not all about yourself or a picket or a picket mm -hmm. or, or you, your little life behind your door. Everybody has to help everybody now. And, and yeah. we've seen that mm -hmm. throughout the, the pandemic uh, where, you know, people shopping for their neighbours that aren't able to go anywhere or, you donation. know. I mean, you know, donations. We've, uh, donations. We've, we have people crossing the pickets that we've never met in our life giving donations. We've had donations from unions, uh, you know, uh, uh, up across the border, both sides, Harlan and Wolf. You know, um, both sides of the border really have, have come together and supported us um, immensely, uh, which, which in a way did unite all the, the unions themselves in supporting um a bunch of, of, of people down down here um but it, it, yeah if anything is to come from this it, it, it's that through the pandemic and what has happened to us that people need to remember it's not just your own little world anymore that you have to give to everyone else and because so many people supported us that if anyone in the future ever needs support for anything we know what it means so we will always offer it then and go because we know it's like to receive that support ourselves. If I could just say one more thing about you tonight, when we were on that loading bay and we locked those gates and we we locked the gates and we actually put locks on them, but um, we were comforted by, it was like a comfort blanket. We knew all our supporters were out on the other side of that gate, even though the guards put those vans up so, you know, to obscure them, you know, so that they couldn't see us and they were on the other side, even family members and everything. That was, that was, we knew we weren't alone. No. And especially when we sang our songs and they answered they us. They answered back. It was we amazing. couldn't see them, but we could hear them answering. And that was amazing. Absolutely. We'll never forget it. We'll never forget it anyway. No. Yeah, and I, I don't think anyone will ever forget what you've done. I think you've earned your place in Irish labour history. You've set an example for others to follow. So I think on that note, um, we might uh, end it there. We'll all give you one last maybe round of applause and uh, we'll hand over to uh, Jerry Carroll to wrap us up. Thank you. And thanks, Carmel. Thank you, everyone. So I think we will hand over to Jerry, who's going to wrap us up and close out the conference. Thanks, Connor. And I just want to say it's incredibly inspiring to hear Jane and, and uh, Carmel. And, you know, I think in a in an era of COVID where we were told we were all in this together, we know we weren't uh, with people like uh, Jane and Carmel and the Devon's workers 
uh, blew that myth apart and, and took a brave stand. So solidarity from myself and I'm sure everybody in, in, across the north uh, and people here today. Um, I think today has been a really important conference um, and fair play to everybody for, for being here and, and thanks to Thomas and Grady and, and yourself, Connor. Um, and I think what we try to do with this conference is to try to put people who are often either ignored in society, uh, but especially ignored or not seen to be front and center of any debate around constitutional change uh, at the heart of the discussion. And today is obviously just a first step, but I think it was important uh, to make that. Um, you know, women, um, ethnic minorities, people who are involved in anti-racist campaigns and many, many other people who we heard uh, throughout today. So I think it was an important step um, and today went, went well. And um, thanks to you, Connor. And, there's a couple of people, Karen, Sai, Paul, Ian, Gavin, Barney, uh, for their work uh, in today and the, the events leading up to today. And I'm sure I've missed out some people, but uh, thanks to those who, who helped with the conference. And I think the conversation, obviously, about United Ireland is very timely and relevant. Um, and what I'm going to try to do in my time is to try to go through some of the myths uh, perpetrated by unionism um, and those kind of effectively backing their arguments at this time. And also talk through the, the limitations of the um, nationalist or mainstream vision of United Ireland and why yeah, I think there needs to be. And I'm sure you all do because this is why you're here, why there needs to be a radical a left wing socialist campaign that can relate to people across the debate in the north, but also um, play an important part and hopefully bring an end to the border and creating a new uh, United Ireland and a new Ireland as well. I think it's quite ironic. I don't know if people have uh, seen this week. Uh, Arlene Foster had the gall to talk about uh, the narrow nationalism of people who are in favour of United Ireland. Uh, no sign of irony from the First Minister, uh, who has pursued a narrow vision of not only her version of British nationalism, but of bigotry and homophobia. Um, the same Arlene Foster who, uh, the week prior, um, said she was distressed when people called her a homophobe um, with no humility or recognition of the fact that her party for decades, as people know, have denied rights to LGBT plus people, uh, women as well, minorities, and have engaged in rampant uh, homophobia. And even uh, just this week, uh, just uh, on Tuesday installment, um, a discussion about uh, so-called conversion therapy, which you know is obviously a bigoted practice aimed to cope, fix or cure um, gay people or trans people. Uh, in, a, in a debate um, in Stormont this week, there was a motion brought to condemn the practice, to outlaw it. The DUP uh, saw fit, uh, presumably, presumably with uh, Arnie Foster's blessing or support, saw fit to bring a, an amendment to basically remove any mention of this dangerous and bogus practice as being harmful uh, to LGBT plus people and, and needing to be uh, outlawed. So one further example of uh, the bigotry and exclusionary form of politics and nationalism espoused by Arnie Foster and the DUP uh, as well. Um, their vision of maintaining the union is one that is in a complete uh, at odds with women, LGBT plus people and everybody who have been denied rights in the North uh, for decades and the DUP have obviously played a fundamental role uh, in that. And whilst it's true that not everybody who is you know, opposed or against the border poll or unity, um, particularly in the North, uh, doesn't maintain this version of politics around conversion therapy or homophobia. I think it's worth pointing out that the biggest deniers uh, of this democratic demand um, are pursuing this narrative. Um, and, you know, very often it's repeated in other quarters across uh, politics and media in the North. Um, one other point put across by the, the DUP and, and others, maybe UUP and, and, and others as well, and smaller unionist parties, um, as a reason to not have a United Ireland or a border poll, and is the case of the National Health Service, and Grady obviously touched upon some of it, uh, but just to expand upon it. Um, you know, they kind of operate as if the NHS was created out of the kindness of the heart of British elites. Um, when it was actually, I think it was Lord Hailsham said in 1943, if you don't give the people social reform, they'll give you social revolution as a way of, you know, keeping the peace after the Second World War and a way to stymie the rise of radical politics that was uh, growing across Europe. Um, and we heard in, in previous meetings in, in Belfast and in, 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 the, in the South as well, um, the, uh, the idea of the NHS was seen as a way to, you know, it was an advance and a, a good thing, but it was seen as a way to kind of maybe placate 
uh, working class people or to stemmy uh, the growth of radical uh, politics. So it was hardly uh, a gift from benevolent British elites, and we should see it uh, not as that. But it is quite stomach churning to hear uh, parties whose ministers um, overseeing the defunding and withdrawal of important services uh, from the NHS talk about the sanctity and importance of the NHS. And it is obviously important. It is uh, something the Socialists have to uh, defend. Uh, even though they have allowed a two-tier health system to emerge, which sees hundreds of thousands of people, just like the South, uh, languishing uh, on waiting lists, and people are able to get uh, treatment for cancer and other services uh, if you have a couple of thousand pounds uh, in the bank. So the NHS is obviously fundamental and essential. I think we need to defend it in the north from ministers uh, often, unionist ministers, um, not always, but often, uh, who have underfunded it massively, uh, but also we have to extend it, uh, the principle and the service to everybody in the south, so everybody can avail of uh, free healthcare from Donegal uh, to Kerry and, and everywhere uh, in between. Um, I think in relation to health generally and COVID, um, we have to say that the two states approach to uh, handling a global pandemic that they seen uh, happening and emerging uh, in other parts of the world uh, has been absolutely disastrous. They have constantly used the excuse of two states, of two different health ministers, two different CMOs, two different, different jurisdictions as a reason to not implement either an effective quarantine system or an effective zero COVID or maximum suppression strategy, whatever you refer to it as. So either the excuse, if you will, or the reality of partition, depending on how you view it, has directly resulted in uh, the thousands, the deaths of thousands of people across the island when countries of similar and bigger sizes have had literally a handful of people dying from a pandemic. So that is on the establishments uh, feeling uh, north uh, and south. Um, and the campaign for an all Ireland NHS is not just a good uh, tagline in any campaign for United Ireland, but it's fundamental to saying to large numbers of people that what we're pitching for here, what we're aiming to fight for, is something uh, fundamentally different and something ultimately worth uh, fighting for. I think in the context of uh, events in the north as well, uh, over recent weeks and around you know Belfast, around yeah, Lanark Way and Rats and, and other parts of the north, uh, some have kind of argued that the call to um, have a border poll, you know, now or to talk about it now, uh, will create further division, further violence, and, and so on and so forth. And but it's just it's very concerning, very worrying to see rats and working class kids, you know, being led out to hurl bricks and petrol bombs at each other. Um, we should put it into you know, context and some form of historical uh, context as others have done much more detail than I, but I think it's worth to, to say this uh, at a closing rally. Um, you know, we've had unionist politicians whipping up tension uh, for weeks and months now. Sammy Wilson, um, MP, uh, called for guerrilla warfare, uh, a quote, um, to uh, push back against the effects of the protocol, as he said. Arlene Foster sitting down with uh, Loyalist Community Council um, representatives and you know people in, in paramilitaries. Uh, and then despite the fact that we've had uh, that, a real, real effort, uh, unionist parties at the UP obviously concerned about many things, but losing uh, seats and votes uh, being primary, primary for them as well. And despite that sort of whipping up of tension and that sort of call to arms, if you will, um, there has been uh, small numbers of people, relatively speaking, uh, out on the streets uh, in, in interfaces uh, compared to the likes of Drum Cree, the flag protests and other events. And that's not to say... Let's not ignore the difficulties for people uh, in interface areas and the difficulties uh, over last, the last few weeks. It's not to say that unionism has lost its grip uh, on working class products and communities, if you want to use that uh, phrase, uh, but it's to say that you know just simply banging the drum will not automatically bring out the same numbers as has done uh, in previous um, years and decades. And for socialists, for radicals, for people north and south, that's something to um, remember and, and, and hold, uh, hold strong too. Uh, and I think part of it is, um, part of the, the reason is because unionism is in a, bit, a deep historical crisis. I think part of it is that, um, you know, whilst people are obviously still unionists, they're absolutely furious with the likes of the DUP, uh, who have particularly hitched their wagon to the Tories. And they could have had any Brexit that they wanted, you know, go suffer a bronze, uh, but they hitched to the Tories and uh, they're in part to blame for um, the uh, protocol and the speeding up uh, of conversations about United Ireland uh, as well. And far from 
protecting the integrity, as they would say, of the United Kingdom. They have played a fundamental role in, in uh, uh, speeding up its uh, fracturing and, and downfall. So I think socialists have a lot to say in this context, and especially in re response to recent uh, events over the last few weeks and months. Uh, we agree with people, you know, whether they're on the Shankill, East Belfast, and Coleraine and Derry, wherever, uh, who are uh, angry uh, with the DUP, uh, with the Tories, people have a right uh, to be angry with those uh, parties and organisations, but not because they are sort of conceding to nationalism, uh, but because they have governed over a political and e economic system has meant an increase in food bank, child poverty has gone through the roof under their watch, and uh, not just in working class Protestant communities, but right across the board in nationalist communities uh, for migrants, uh, for uh, ethnic minorities and everybody else. So for, for people here, I think any vision of United Ireland has to have these issues front and centre. Uh, they have to be um, really, really fundamental in any campaign for a radical vision uh, of United Ireland. People who are ground down by poverty, why would they be supportive uh, or interested in swapping one flag or one constitutional change uh, if it's uh, one different constitutional setup for another if there's no guarantee uh, or there's no talk or conversation of the improvement in the conditions of uh, their lives uh, and their neighbours? And that's um, where some of those who are advocating unity, not today, not in this conference, uh, have serious uh, shortcomings in my view. I think there's still a pervasive and dominating idea that says we need to park all questions that are connected to reshaping the economy, uh, to uh, tackling and defeating neoliberalism and capitalism, park all those questions, and we'll come to those at some other uh, stage after the border poll is called and possibly uh, won. I think that's an incorrect and, and mistaken uh, strategy. Um, any campaign that uh, seeks um, to have an alliance or that appeals directly to the United States, the European Union, or any other big imperial power, or is palatable to them, and their interest is one that not only will do nothing ultimately for working class communities, and uh, probably make their conditions worse, but also be self-defeating, uh, as many people may refer to stability as limited and precarious and uh, changing as it is to the unknown economic uncertainty of, of something else. So I think we have to put uh, class and socialist policies at the heart of every single discussion about United Ireland, and that's what we're trying to do uh, today. And there's obviously been a lot of talk of uh, recently in the North uh, about deprivation, poverty, and alienation. Uh, but the problem has been posed in a way that if you're poor, if you're depraved, if you have low wages, the problem is the oversight of the fence. The problem is, you know, if you live in the Shankill, you're told the problem is on the Springfield Road and the Falls Road, they've got great community centres and wonderful houses over there. When in actual reality, in the Shackle, Springfield and Falls, both communities are living in uh, underfunded community centres, not enough of them, uh, and terrible housing, not enough of it. Uh, public housing hasn't been built at, at any great length uh, as well. Um, and the real divide ult ultimately in society, uh, in the North, we're told it's between the two communities, you know, unionism, nationalism, and those who live in those different uh, communities. But the real divide is obviously class. Um, and whilst most people have been left behind in the North, most people have, have seen their situation uh, deteriorate and get worse uh, post Good Friday Agreement, economically and socially. There's a few who have done very, very well uh, out of the peace process, a new middle class, uh, many mil multi-millionaires uh, have, have shot up uh, in the North uh, and the South um, as well. Okay, I think my time's coming up, so just <laughs> bear with me. Connor's shaking his head, yeah, okay. Um, and I think uh, mainstream nationalism or mainstream advocate, advocates for, for end and partition uh, aren't really talking about these uh, issues front and center. They're left at the side or sometimes they're purpose, purposefully left off uh, the agenda. And I think we need to put these issues uh, front and center. And some or even not all, but some uh, people who are for in Ireland are actually uh, trying to say now that we need to change the threshold 51% is no longer good enough to have a successful border poll. Anybody who's in a campaign, uh, whether it's elections or whatever it is, always wants more than 51%. You want as much and as high as you possibly can. But that idea of saying that it can't be uh, if a border poll or referendum uh, isn't beyond a 60 or 70% or whatever the figure is plucked out of the air is fundamentally undemocratic and, and socialist and radicals and people on the left should absolutely reject that and see that uh, democracy is democracy and it shouldn't be rewritten. 
And I think recent change, and I'll finish on this, uh, obviously people here know, but it's worth just re-emphasizing, recent change on the island uh, hasn't happened by speaking nicely uh, or, pe- or by appealing to those in power, but it's happened through uh, activism, through campaigning, and repeal and equal marriage are the two obvious uh, ones. So those in charge who denied uh, or who were on the wrong side of those issues are the same people who are denying or slowing down or trying to prevent or stall any proper discussion about a United Ireland or a border poll or any issues rela- related uh, to that. So I think for us, um, this is obviously an important start in, in the conversation, um, but I, I think mass mobilization, people power, those are key concepts to uh, not only uh, make sure a border poll happens, because Boris Johnson is, is obviously saying it's going to take a very, very long time. So we need to see mass mobilization is key to getting a referendum uh, called, getting a border poll called, but also to make it successful um, because we can't just, and we will not just go back in our boxes and just simply vote uh, for the referendum for a yes vote when it comes. We will see, and uh, we have to see uh, the the project of ending partition as part of a project of fundamentally reshaping politics on the island of Ireland. And that means mobilizations as somebody said in the last session before, during and after any referendum campaign. And uh, I think we need to bear that in mind uh, going forward. So thanks everybody. Um, and thanks everybody for coming here. Um, and I think it was a very, very important and worthwhile uh, conversation. I have much more to say, but Connor is gonna shut me up here. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, just to extend a thank you to our other speakers, to Thomas, to Gretti, to the Heroic Debenhams workers, and to all of you for uh, making this conference such a, a great success. Um, hopefully, uh, it won't be the end of the conversation as I've been pushing and as others have. We have got a link. We do hope to follow this up for further discussion. So really do leave your details around and we'll hopefully continue this uh, in the very near future. Uh, so do, do leave those details and uh, we might call it there. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a good weekend.